Hi, I'm Lynn Packer. This video is a YouTube supplement to my book, Lying for the Lord, the Paul H. Dunn Stories. It's about accessing restricted LDS historical records. The LDS Church still hides sensitive historical records and lies about their existence. One caveat, this presentation is mostly for scholars and journalists trying to access Mormon Church archival material. It may be of some interest to uh, church history buffs. It's about my failed quest to get records. I stumbled across the LDS Church's surprisingly corrupt record access procedures while researching an article for Salt Lake Magazine. The article is about a 1913 Hollywood-style movie authorized and partly funded by the church. I sought records I was certain the church had and thought they would release. The article is about the 1913 silent film, 100 Years of Mormonism. Salt Lake Magazine has tentatively scheduled it for January of next year. Here's a still photo from the movie uh, showing the assassination of Joseph Smith. And despite denials that it appeared the church authorized and partly funded the production of the movie, records would have shown the extent of the church's involvement. But I hit a brick wall. That wall shields evidence the church was swindled by the film's Hollywood producers. The 1913 picture was the first time that a sanitized church history would be portrayed on the big screen, and the concealed movie records would help document the sanitizing process as well as the swindle that occurred. It's really about keeping unpleasant truths from uh, members of the church. I don't know if you saw the movie A Few Good Men, where Tom Cruise plays a lieutenant who cross-examines an officer uh, played by uh, Jack Nicholson and uh, Cruz is trying to get the, the, the truth from the witness. And the movie has the very famous line, you can't handle the truth. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! For decades, LDS leaders, in essence, have been saying the same thing to their followers. You can't handle the truth about your own church's history. But what about all the transparency talk? Former President Gordon B. Hinckley said, We have nothing to hide. Our history is an open book. Nothing to hide? President Hinckley made the statement in 1985, just after the church was caught hiding records in connection with a massive historical documents fraud and two pipe bomb murders. His statement that the church had nothing to hide simply was not true. He was lying for the Lord. Why do public figures lie? Sometimes in public, on camera. Maybe they think their adherents can't handle the truth. Maybe the leaders themselves can't handle the truth. Maybe because lies are often very effective. Church leaders' license to lie is historical. It goes back to the beginning, at the outset of church history, when founder Joseph Smith lied about practicing polygamy. Lying for the Lord became part of the fabric of Mormonism and continues today. Hiding and lying, the proclaimed only true church has a fundamental problem with telling the truth about its history. As an example, that 1985 bomb explosion I just uh, talked about uh, brought that fact to light in dramatic fashion. It involved the most notorious murder in Utah history and greatest historical document fraud in American history. In 1985, document dealer Mark Hoffman murdered two Utahns connected with historical Mormon records. This is a shot of his sports car where he was uh, going to place a third bomb to kill someone else, and it accidentally went off in his car, injuring him. Hoffman's forged documents fooled even the LDS Church's first presidency. 
Here's Hoffman on the left, and he dealt primarily with Gordon B. Hinckley, who was in the First Presidency at the time. And this record that he gave the church in 1980 purported to show characters used in the translation of the Book of Mormon, and of course it was, it was a fraud. His fraud concept was this. He knew church leaders locked embarrassing documents in a vault. He knew they would buy his forged, historical, controversial Mormon documents to keep them from being published by reporters, scholars, or anti-Mormon Christians. It was a historical records-intensive case. Here, Hoffman is conferring with his attorney about uh, the records, and I was a reporter at the time meeting with them uh, as I covered the story for KSL News in Salt Lake. One of the key letters was the so-called Salamander Letter. It was purported to have been written in 1830 from Martin Harris to W.W. W. Phelps. It was about an angel appearing to Joseph Smith, showing him the location of some golden plates that had been buried in a hill. And according to the letter, this is what the letter said, when Smith dug up the gold plates, a white salamander appeared, which transformed itself into a spirit. Not, it wasn't about the angel that the, in the church story of the event. Here's how it was portrayed in a drawing, and the Salt Lake Tribune made a cartoon out of the white salamander. Indeed, that was part of an editorial cartoon at the time. I called it the cat out of the bag uh, cartoon, where you have a white salamander, uh, the, the letter springing out of the first presidency's vault where it had been hidden away, but exposed because of the, the murder and uh, document uh, controversy. There was another letter uh, purported to have been written by Joseph Smith in his own hand to Josiah Stoll. And in it, of course it was false, a fake letter, 19-year-old Joseph Smith wrote his employer claiming a clever spirit was guarding buried treasure being sought with a divining rod. Gordon Hinckley paid $15,000 for it in January of 1983, and Hoffman uh, then told a collector that President Hinckley said that letter will never see the light of day. It was placed in the First Presidency's vault. But rumors spread that the church had bought the stole letter, even though they were trying to keep it a secret. Church spokesman Jerry Cahill said, the church doesn't have the letter. It's not in the church archives or the first presidency's vault. But when it became clear that some Mormon scholars had photocopies and were going to turn them over to the press, the church came clean. Cahill admitted his earlier statement was in error. The purported letter was indeed inquired by the church, he said. For the present, it is stored in the first presidency's archives. He was caught essentially lying for the Lord. After selling the church dozens of fake records, Hoffman turned to murder to cover up his crimes and was eventually charged criminally for that and for fraud. He pled guilty to fraud and murder, but it was after a preliminary hearing. Here I am as a reporter just chatting with Hoffman. He, he wouldn't do uh, direct interviews. And after he pled guilty, uh, he continued to not do interviews. So a lot of his story remains a mystery. Fast forward to today. The church continues paying a heavy price for suppressing truths about its history. An increasing number of members have been discovering those truths via non-official sources, especially on the internet. The church has conceded the truth of some embarrassing facts by posting the so-called essays on its website, lds.org. And here's a, a typical uh, gospel topic essay example about the Book of Mormon translation. The official version for years is that, and here a uh, drawing uh, depicts it, that Joseph Smith had looked directly at the golden plates and dictated 
his translation to a scribe. But according to the, you know, the essay that was posted, it says, according to these accounts, Joseph placed either the interpreters or the seer stone in a hat, pressed his face into the hat to block out extraneous light and read aloud the English words that appeared on the instrument. So it was the so-called rock in a hat translation method. Richard Bushman is a highly respected Mormon historian who studied at Harvard, BYU, and Columbia. He was an LDS bishop, a state president, but uh, Bushman, apparently under authority of the church, has been going around the United States speaking with groups of Mormons who were concerned and some of them even very surprised, if not shocked, about some of the information the church is posting on its website about uh, historical facts. And here's what he says. He said, for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. He's, he's basically saying it needs to rewrite its history. And he said, the dominant narrative is not true. It can't be sustained, is what he's been saying. And you wondered if he had said that 20 years ago, whether he would have been excommunicated. And he said, there have been so many disruptive facts come on the scene. And he gives an example, the seer stone and a hat. And he says um, he would be told by members he's talking to things like, why wasn't I told this before? They've been lying to me all along. And he said they feel a sense of betrayal and some even rage and anger about the church having lied to them about the history. There's been a lot of statements about transparency and the church opening up. Apostle Russell Ballard said, the church is dedicated to transparency and has donated precious resources to provide new insights and offer even more context to the story of the restoration through the Joseph Smith papers which is another thing that is posted online and the gospel topics essays on LDS.org. Then Matthew Groh, who is publications director of the church history department, said the Joseph Smith papers project is the great symbol of the church's transparency with its history. Well, are those statements true? My experience seeking records about the 1913 silent film is, is that the church used smoke screens, wild goose chases, and false statements to obscure the records and was not more transparent. It seems like they had circled the wagons for the siege. Just, uh, you know, it's the sort of the ongoing bunker uh, mentality that the church has, that it's under attack. And the chronology of my odyssey to get these records began on June 28th uh, of this year. I first saw two very specific records uh, of letters that had been sent by the first presidency. And there was the first presidency at the time. And these letters were sent to the Utah Moving Picture Company in Los Angeles and I had the exact dates, January 24th, 1913, and February 5th of the same year. By all appearances, they had the letters in paper and microfilm form, because in the mid-70s, a, a, an historian had made partial transcripts of the letters from microfilm at the LDS Church History Archive. I needed actual copies. I even provided the call number when I asked to get the records and the title of the microfilm reel. I figured once they got to my request, it would take less than a half hour to find, copy, and email the letters. Meanwhile, uh, because you get in line, they, they can't do it immediately, uh, I made a phone call to Church Public Affairs. And this is typically done by reporters, uh, both as a courtesy to let them know I'm doing an article and to get help with the article that you're, uh, or news story that you're working on. I requested their assistance, getting access now to all church records regarding the motion picture. 
I expressed hope the response to my inquiry would reflect the church's professed policy for greater historical transparency. And I expressed certainty the church library would have extensive records about the film. On July 11th, I got an email back from Tyson Thorpe. He was the librarian who was first began looking for the two specific letters and then was given the assignment to look for all records. And this was two weeks after my initial request. And Thorpe, the librarian, could not find the two specific letters or any other records about the film. He found essentially nothing. So I emailed back to my contact at Public Affairs and expressed surprise not a single record could be found. I wrote that the church must have hundreds of documents and references to the making of the film. It was a, it was a big deal back then. I asked if all the records had been lost or destroyed. I provided even more detail about the church's extensive dealings with the motion picture company. Then on July 15th, I got an email from Public Affairs, and he said the History Library will put additional staff on the search who can make a deeper dive. On July 15th, later the same day, I got an email back from the History Library. They had reviewed multiple First Presidency, Quorum of the Twelve, Presiding Bishop Rick, and Joseph F. Smith collections found nothing still, even after a more intensive search. The email referred to a single document that had already been online for a long time. They disclosed that they had looked for the same records before for a BYU film historian uh, years before and had found nothing. And they said this has been a long time mystery. They couldn't figure out themselves what happened to these records. There's a, a an online LDS film history chronology that shows various uh, Mormon-sponsored films. And this film, uh, a still photo of it, appears on that chronology for 1913 as the very first church commissioned film. And they mentioned this in the July 15th email, which said the chronology at mormonnewsroom.org about the film 100 Years of Mormonism is inaccurate. They said that that's wrong. It was not the first church commission film, since we cannot prove the level of the church's involvement from records discovered so far, which was zero. A spokesman later said, if merited, we will change the language. That is, they'll go back on the website and indicate it was not the first church commission film. On July 18th, there was an email exchange, uh, me to public affairs and public affairs back. The spokesman said a number of department directors worked to gather the information. I said, how could dozens, if not hundreds of records be missing? I'm asking this again. And now the spokesman said, Keith Erickson, the library director will engage. So now the top guy is gonna review again the failure to find these records. Then on July 20th, I um, also ask about some film fragments. I wrote that I'd been told the church had no copy of the film itself, but some pieces of it. I requested a digital copy of the film strips in their archives, and the request was denied because it might be intellectual property. And I was puzzled by that because they said they didn't own the film so they wouldn't have intellectual property rights over the film, which probably would have expired anyway. On July 21st, um, I received a phone call and I wasn't here and I called back. And Dale Jones said Keith Erickson had done research and he had found nothing more. But Jones said this, any first presidency office correspondence is confidential. This is, he's telling me this for the first time. He said, Erickson does not have access to that, even though he's over the library. He said, I could make a request through the office of the first presidency, but most such requests are denied due to privacy. So he said, we don't have it. You're gonna have to go through the first presidency. So I emailed back, I made a formal request, even though I was told it would probably be denied. 
I asked why I was not told about the separate record keeping three weeks earlier. I also pointed out that Librarian Thorpe said he had searched first presidency records and stated the obvious, the previous responses were extraordinarily deceptive and dishonest. I continued in my email that the history library's position that the missing records was a mystery can't really be a mystery if they didn't check all the records. And I repeated my surprise that given the church's claimed greater transparency that my request was not handled quickly and fully. And I cited First Presidency, Second Counselor Dieter Uchtdorf's statement that we always need to remember that transparency and openness keep us clear of the negative side effects of secrecy, that truth and transparency complement each other. The same day I got a pub, uh, from Public Affairs, I got an email back and Jones confirmed Librarian Thorpe had accessed the First Presidency correspondence and provided what he learned. So now I'm puzzled. Now he said, okay, he did access it. And he said, this is a thorough and comprehensive review, which actually contradicted what he had just sent. So I fire back with another email. Are you saying your librarian reviewed all First Presidency records? even restricted records or just so-called public records? Did he find the specific microfilm reel that supposedly has the two specific 1913 letters I requested? Again, for the what, third or fourth time I ask, have records been lost or destroyed? I get an email back and Jones said the librarian reviewed all First Presidency records, which are public, but he does not have access to the specific first presidency file that may exist. And he again said, I needed to seek permission through the office of the first presidency. So what I did is I then repeated that request in an email and I asked about the first presidency's vault and for specifics about their policies and file locations. See, now I'm trying to figure out, well, what happened to the records? It appears that they've been lost and I restated the fact that responses had been deceptive and misleading. Well, I didn't hear anything back. So on July 26, I decided, okay, I'll just make the request myself. And I called the office of the first presidency. It was a direct call. And I was told secretary Alyssa Whiteman has access to the vault. And so I spoke with her. I requested records pertaining to the movie and sent her an email with details, and she said she'd look in their vault. So she said, okay, I'll check. She emailed back. She said she checked everywhere she could think of and had come up empty. She said, it appears we don't have the information you need. I emailed back, because now I had more questions. I asked where she looked. I asked if the material in the vault had been indexed or logged. Do they, you know, in other words, do they have a good idea what they have? and ask if material in that vault had been transferred somewhere else. So it could be, maybe it wasn't in that exact vault. But I want to give you a little bit of back, background about the First Presidency's vault location. This is the uh, church administration building at 47 East South Temple. And the vault is down there in the southeast corner of the first floor and it's managed by the secretary of the first presidency. And it's an actual like bank vault with a huge round uh, thick door. There are likely other vaults as well. Now the next slide will show where the first presidency archives have been transferred since 1917. The sort of relocations of what they call the vault. And in 1917, it was moved from across the street to the administration building when that building was constructed, where I just showed you in the previous slide. Then in 1972, it was moved to the east wing of the church office building. And now it was a locked room, but they still called it the vault. And so you had sort of one vault and then uh, another remote location for the vault. Then again, in 2009, when they constructed the historical library, yet again, another locked room was created and called the First Presidency's Vault. 
And there's also a locked area of the uh, so-called granite vault up Little Cottonwood Canyon that is apparently under the First Presidency's control. And really, who knows how records have been going uh, back and forth and when that happened. Now, on July 27th, the executive secretary for the First Presidency, Brooke Hales, remember I said he's the one who actually manages the First Presidency vault, he sends me basically an unsolicited email. He says, and he's responding to the questions I ask, we do not have the items you're looking for, and he didn't answer any of the questions. So I write right back, because I still have the questions, I repeated them, and ask about what is under the First Presidency's control, and where they might be, if not uh, in the First Presidency's vault itself. He sent uh, another one back and just says, we were unable to find any reference to the documents uh, that you're looking for. I wish I had better news. In other words, he's saying, have a nice day. I'm not gonna answer your questions. So then on July 29th, I sent an email to Public Affairs and the First Presidency's office. I let Public Affairs know who told me that the records might be there, that they don't have them. I repeated my request for more information about how and where records are archived. And I restated my concern about church public affairs not having a stellar reputation for honesty. And I cited, among other uh, things, my experience covering the Mark Hoffman murder fraud story. I didn't get a response to that. So on August 5th, I filed what I call the appeal. I guess you could call it that. What I did is I called the First Presidency's office and sent an email, and I copied Public Affairs and Brooke Hales on the email. And I said, I continue to believe extensive records about the movie are in the First Presidency's vault, probably the one at the Church History Library, that's the locked room. And I asked the Second Counselor Dieter Uchtdorf review the process and require compliance. Well, he never replied back. The reply I got was from Public Affairs uh, on August 9th, after I filed this appeal. Is, um, and, and well, just like I said, I would not received a response. The email explained the restricted records. It said, the Church History Library holds collections that are open to the public as well as collections for which access is restricted. So this is in the library. He's talking about not the First Presidency's vault. The email said that I did not formally request a review of the Church History Library's restricted collections, which is not true, but that's what the email said. And the email goes on. And in the email, there was a bombshell disclosure this time. This is after I'd made the appeal. The email says, amazingly, we have reviewed those collections, they said were restricted, and located the two letters to which you referred. The email said the original letters are part of a collection that is closed to research. So this was stunning. As a reporter and a writer, I may use, maybe I use an exclamation point once every six months, but this was to me stunning. After five weeks of repeated requests for two very specific letters, the church had finally found them, but would not release them, would not say where they found them, would not say if there had been any search for the other dozens or hundreds of records. The email said, we've been truthful. And it said, we have nothing further to add. So essentially the email said, we've got two letters. We're not talking to you anymore. So that ended my search for records through the church. So I sought some outside expert commentary to see what other experts, how they would view this process. And one I talked to was uh, Jeff Johnson, who was a former LDS Church Historical Department supervisor and then also a former director of the Utah State Archives. So I said, I asked Jeff, how long would it have taken you 
when you were there to find the two specific first presidency letters. And he knew exactly what I was talking about and where they would be. He said, about 10 minutes. And then I said, would they have been restricted then? He said, no, not that far back, no concern. So as you can see, the policy has, uh, the, you know, the access has been restricted uh, greatly since he was there. I asked Brent Metcalf, a Mormon historian who was a former Mark Hoffman confidant, does, still does a lot of research at the church library. And Brent said this, there are groups within the historical department and within the hierarchy, he means the leadership of the church, who are genuinely making a good faith effort to be more transparent. He said the shift toward transparency is the best thing they could have done for the health and longevity of the church. And about my situation, he said, why would they try to hide that? They're not doing anyone any favors, certainly not themselves. I also talked to an unnamed Mormon historian familiar with the church's restricted access policy, and he didn't want his name used because he still, still deals with them a lot. He said, I don't see how the guidelines would restrict access to an early film about the history of the Latter-day Saints. He said, I would have supposed access would have been granted. Well, since then, more proof that LDS Public Affairs and the Historical uh, Library are hiding records, more proof has emerged. I found another film-related document that the church has, that I know that it has, but would not admit having and would not disclose. It's more evidence that they're hiding records, but it also shows that the church did, in fact, commission the 1913 film and did put money into the movie. The proof is, or, or 1913 diary entries made by uh, Anton H. Lund. He was uh, a member of the first uh, presidency at the time. So there are several Lund diary entries that refer to the movie. In June, uh, on the 28th of 1913, he talks about a Mr. Russell, Mr. Russell was uh, the representative of one of the involved uh, film uh, companies. He said, Mr. Russell, the picture man, came in and promised to make a good picture of the 100 years of Mormonism, which film he has bought but wanted to borrow $10,000 to get it started. The movie had actually been completed. The church didn't like it. Rights were sold to a company that uh, this Russell controlled and they were talking about remaking or reworking the film. Then on August 12th, his diary uh, says, Mr. Russell gave us a list of the scenes he intends to change, which was approved by us. And those scenes, I know from other research, had been shot a month earlier in Salt Lake City. The diary continues on October 20th, Major H.M. Russell, he went by Major, I think he was actually a Civil War uh, veteran, but he said, uh, Major Russell wants a loan of $5,000. Russell has the belief that he can just call on us for money and we will pay it. What had actually happened, I know from, again, other research, is they had given him some money and uh, the last payment of $5,000 was due and the church was hesitating paying it. On October 21st, the next day, he said, we heard uh, Brother F.S. Richards' report upon the status of Mr. Russell's security. So apparently he had given them some sort of security. I don't know what it is. And F.S. Richards was the, the church's legal counsel. Still going on. Um, uh, President Lund is now talking about a meeting where the film was going to be discussed. And he says, I told the brethren, the other people who had shown up for the meeting, before the president came in that I believed it was throwing good money after bad money. So he didn't want the, the final $5,000 paid. They, the other apostles, he said, thought we were better, uh, that we better do so. Otherwise, all the money would be lost, which had already uh, paid towards getting the moving picture of 100 years of Mormonism. 
But then the president came in and the, the diary notation says the president decided he would not continue to pay money out and told F.S. Richards, the attorney, to so inform him, Mr. Russell. And that was really the beginning of the end of the movie, as my article, when it comes out, will talk about. Here's what I think is the church's historical records game plan going forward. Release only controversial records it has to, and even then under tight control and in a faith-promoting form. Make access to sensitive records it does not want released even more restrictive, which is very clear that they've done. It's like releasing skeletons, all these skeletons that's in the church archives uh, closet. And some have been released through the gospel topic essays. I see it as like putting lipstick on pigs. But they've only let one come out at a time. They'll let a skeleton come out and then dress it up in a tux and then release it. A few have been released, and now I don't think any more are going to be. And certainly don't bother requesting on your own to uh, uh, get uh, access to one of the skeletons. Now even tougher guardians, uh, there's tougher guardians of the records and of the faith controversial records. It's like a bulldog protecting him. It's this thing all over again. You can't handle the truth. At least the members can't. Okay, maybe a few bits and pieces that we control through the gospel uh, essays. History repeats itself. Remember Gordon Hinckley in 1985? We have nothing to hide. Our history is an open book. And President Dieter Uchtdorf in the first presidency in 2014 said, transparency and openness keep us clear of the negative side effects of secrecy. We always need to remember that transparency and openness keep us clear of the negative side effects of secrecy or the cliche of faith-promoting rumors. Truth and transparency complement each other. Satan, according to President Uchtdorf, is behind the doubt raised by the critics. He said there are many who create doubt about everything and anything. Satan is the great deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, the father of all lies. For those who already embrace the truth, his primary strategy is to spread the seeds of doubt. For example, he has caused many members of the church to stumble when they discover information about the church that seems to contradict what they had learned previously. That seems to contradict what they had learned previously is what he just said. He really is turning truth on its head. Uh, President Uchtdorf is essentially saying it's okay for church leaders and educators to have used falsehoods and fiction to build faith-promoting history, but it's not okay for church critics or historians, journalists, to have used truth, true historical facts, that may cast doubt on the official history, and of course, attributing this to the devil. Again, continuing with what I think is the LDS Church's game plan, attribute use of true but embarrassing historical facts to Satan, downplay LDS.org's posting of sensitive historical facts. And what I mean by that is, is they really didn't trumpet this. Uh, they didn't send out an announcement to all the LDS wards or to Sunday school teachers and priesthood teachers. They just sort of posted it there because I think the plan is still to try and shield adult Mormons who have grown up with the, uh, with the, with the false history. And they'll use secrecy and deception to block scholar and reporter access to controversial historical facts that are still buried, but they will inoculate the youth with tiny doses 
of true historical facts using the term inoculate. Defining inoculation, the medical term, is to protect someone against a particular disease by injecting a small amount of the disease into them so that their body becomes immune to it. Now here's what's interesting. Mike Quinn is a renowned Mormon history scholar. In my view, maybe is the best. He was a return missionary, a Vietnam veteran, a professor at uh, BYU, and was later uh, pushed out of, uh, forced out of BYU, and then excommunicated. But in 1981, he was still at BYU, and this is when I just began teaching at BYU, and this is a decade before the internet. And listen to what he said as a historian who is writing about some of these uh, sensitive historical facts. He said, the central argument of the enemies of the LDS church is historical. And if we seek to build the kingdom of God by ignoring or denying the problem areas of our past, we are leaving the saints unprotected. He said, believing Mormon historians like myself seek to write candid church history in a context of perspective in order to inoculate the saints against the historical disease germs that apostates and anti-Mormons may thrust upon them. And when I talked to Mike about this, he said the concept's term, that is inoculate, was coined by Leonard Arrington in 1972, almost 10 years before that, who was church historian and wanted to begin this process. Quinn in, uh, continued to say later in 2011 that the church should start preparing them, that is kids, in seminary with just a tidbit a week. That way they're not going to be blindsided by those primarily evangelical Protestants who use Mormon history as a battering ram to destroy the faith of members of the church who have not heard of these things. So that's Mike Quinn. Now in 2016, 35 years later, Apostle Russell, Russell Ballard says this, inoculate, and he's saying this to uh, church educators, inoculate your students by providing faithful, thoughtful, and accurate interpretation of gospel doctrine, the scriptures, our history, and those topics that are sometimes misunderstood. So what is he talking about? He said to name a few such topics that are less known or controversial. I'm talking about polygamy, seer stones, different accounts of the first vision, the process of translation of the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham. He's not the only one. This, this year, 2016, LDS Church historian Stephen Snow said, and now curriculum and seminaries and institute can safely weave these essays into a future curriculum to, in a sense, inoculate, again, the youth, the rising generation, so they can learn a little bit about these things without being totally shocked when they hear them for the first time. Again, what Mike Quinn, who was excommunicated, had said years and years earlier. Now, uh, near conclusion, just uh, sort of this update, <laughs> because, uh, I, I was surprised by this. It was not the end of my attempted records access story. On August 25th, this is after they had cut off communication, I got an email from the LDS History Library. It just came out of the blue, and apparently Tyson Thorpe had sent it. Here's what it said. While helping with another request, one of my coworkers came across some correspondence to Joseph F. Smith the deal with 100 years of Mormonism. They're from Harry A. Kelly and H.M. Russell. I want to express my apologies for not finding these in my review a few weeks ago. I wasn't provided with Kelly and Russell as potential correspondence, so I wasn't looking for correspondence from them. Here's my email uh, analysis of the email. He does not disclose who made another request. Who would be making another request? I was the only one that I knew of researching the film. He doesn't disclose who found the records. 
And he falsely states, I did not provide Kelly's and Russell's name, names. Because on July 15th, six weeks earlier, I had sent an email, said, here's where I think a few of many places the documents and references would show up. I said, promoter Harry A. Kelly was in Salt Lake in June and again in July of 1912 to discuss the project. I'm also aware of another instance where on September 13, 1913, a Major H. M. Russell met with Anton H. Lund about the reshooting that had been done to enhance the film. I'd already told him about this. So they said they found the records but I would have to uh, solicit access to the records from the Access Review Committee. So I filed that request, thinking I'm probably not going to get them. But on September 1st, Keith Erickson, who is the library director, now I get an email from the top guy there. He sends me an email. Access approved. Photocopies not permitted. I can just go there and look at them and take notes. And now he says the status of your request is now closed. So, again, my request was uni unilaterally ended for a second time. The closed and the, the emphasis was in his email. We're, we're you know, finished with this. But at any rate, I went in to do the research at the church library and was permitted to see uh, those files. And then I sent an email back just so I could report on what I saw, uh, of the records that I saw. Of course, I said it's not true that Russell's and Kelly's names were not provided, because I had. Uh, again, it took them six weeks, despite additional staff and department directors looking to find them. And I said their discovery confirms the records were there all along, but still, I think they're only the tip of the iceberg, and you still need to find and provide access to what has to be dozens, if not hundreds, of records. So here's my conclusion and my forecast. I think the church will slow down, perhaps stop releasing skeletons as essays on LDS.org. We've probably seen the last of that. I think the church will continue to highly restrict reporter and historian access to the skeletons. I think that they will continue to be locked away, and over the next couple of decades, many members will continue to be shocked as an occasional skeleton escapes between the bars. The drip, 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 I think the bleeding will just go on. Again, this was a, a PowerPoint supplement to my book, Lying for the Lord, the Paul H. Dunn stories. And I just stick the cartoon ending up there because this has been somewhat, this effort has been somewhat uh, cartoonish. My book is available at uh, kindle.com as an ebook and in paperback at the Amazon bookstore. And again, uh, the article 100 Years of Mormonism is slated to appear uh, in Salt Lake uh, Magazine in January 2017.